Hello, AP European History students. This is your teacher, Mr. Endress. I certainly hope that you are having a wonderful day. This is the beginning of our second unit, which is on the Reformation. The Reformation refers to the Reformation of the Roman Catholic Church. At the dawn of the 16th century, the Roman Catholic Church was doing things that many people thought uh, these things aren't too Christian and that the Roman Catholic Church needed to be reformed, hence the word the Reformation. However, the Roman Catholic Church at the time, which was a very powerful, wealthy institution, many of the people in charge of the Roman Catholic Church were not interested in any type of Reformation as it would diminish the wealth and power of the Roman Catholic Church. So the story of the Reformation is a story of this conflict. It's, there are many stories of conflict, and it seems to be, on the surface, a very religious thing. It is not. It gets into politics, money. It even gets into family life and the roles of women. The Reformation hit culture on every level, and these massive cultural changes, which were a product of the Reformation of 16th century Europe, are still very much with us today. Your personal ideas about morality, your personal ideas about you having rights and your ability to rebel, your personal ideas about what a family is or what a family could be. Many of the ideas that you have personally today in the 21st century, 21st century actually go all the way back to the era of the Reformation. So yes, it was a monumental time of change and creation in Western civilization. So, let's begin here. This is the city of Prague. This is Prague today, obviously. It is the capital of the country, the Czech Republic. If you can, take a moment to look at this beautiful picture here of Prague. It looks like Prague in the evening. You see in the foreground here the Vltava River and the Charles Bridge going over it. That Charles Bridge is a very touristy area if you ever visit Prague. But then look in the background there. You see this huge castle with a church, a cathedral behind it. That enormous castle that you see there is in fact by square foot, by, by the square footage, the largest castle in the world. If you would like to visit that castle as a tourist, and you can, and you want to visit every single room in that castle, I don't know if you can do that or not, it would take you five full days. It's a big place. And that castle plays a very important part in the whole entirety of European history. I'll keep coming back to the Prague Castle, which is what they call it in Prague. The, well, the, in, in Prague, they just call it the castle. We call it the Prague Castle. Behind Prague Castle, you see... St. Vitus Cathedral, which is another important icon in the city of Prague. Okay, so allow me to talk for just a moment here about the city of Prague and the region in which it is, it is situated. So today, Prague is the capital of the Czech Republic, or we can also refer to it informally as Czechia. Another version of the word Czechia is the name that most people in Western Europe refer to this region as throughout most of European history, which is Bohemia. So Bohemia, Czechia, the Czech Republic, for the most part, all the same thing. The Czech people, or the Bohemians, their story throughout most of European history is one of fighting for their independence. So we begin our story of European history in the year 1450. And at that time, the Bohemians and the city of Prague and the region of Bohemia, which was at this time a kingdom, it was part of the larger Holy Roman Empire. But the poor Bohemians, the Holy Roman Empire was mostly Germanic. So I'm going to talk a little bit about ethnicities here. Most of the people of the Holy Roman Empire back then which would today constitute mostly Germany, Austria, Switzerland. These people, the majority of the people in the Holy Roman Empire, considered themselves to be ethnically Germanic. But the people of Bohemia did not consider themselves to be ethnically Germanic. They saw that they 
their ethnicity was Slavic. So they ethnically considered themselves to be closer to the Russian people. Okay, so that may or may not make sense to you. Ethnicity is sometimes a you know, difficult thing for me to talk about or to explain. But suffice it to say this, the Bohemian people who lived in the kingdom of Bohemia, who had Prague as their capital city, they were part of the larger Holy Roman Empire and they just felt different. We've got a different language. We speak Czech. We don't speak a variety of German that they speak in the German lands of Saxony or Hesse or Bavaria or in places like Austria or Switzerland. We here in Bohemia, we speak a different language, which means that we're culturally a little bit different, but we're part of this larger Germanic empire, the Holy Roman Empire. So what I'm hopefully setting up, hopefully you can tell what I'm setting up for you here. The Bohemians feel like they're the redheaded stepchild of the Holy Roman Empire, that they're just sort of different. They don't really get along with the rest of the family. And throughout much of our story of modern European history, the Bohemians, the Czech people, they're just going to want to be free. They're going to want to be their own country doing their own thing. And poor Bohemia, throughout most of European history, they are under the thumb of some other major European power. So when we start off here in 1450, it's the Holy Roman Empire. And then we'll learn about how during the latter half of the 17th century, after the year 1648, Holy Roman Empire starts to weaken a little bit. But one part of the Holy Roman Empire, Austria, it starts growing, creating its own empire, and that includes ruling Bohemia. And the Austrian Empire grows and grows and grows until the First World War, and then Austria participates in the First World War. Some people would say they caused it, uh, but we'll get to that when we get to that. And Austria is part of the losing side of World War I. And then, finally, in 1919, the Bohemians and the Czechs, they go free. Now, they were unified with their neighbors to the east, the Slovaks, but they became their own country, Czechoslovakia. And in 1919, Czechoslovakia is a free and independent and democratic country, and that lasted for 20 years. And in 1939, the Nazis took them all over. That takeover started in 1938. In 1939, it was all over. The Nazis took them over. So not quite 20 years of freedom. And then the Nazis ruled over. And then World War II happened. And then the Nazis lose World War II. But here's the Soviets. And the Czechoslovak people, even though they had their own country, they were pretty much under the dominance of the Soviet Union. And we know that because in 1968, when they tried to do their own thing independent of the Soviet Union, here came the Soviet tanks into this city, Prague, and they crushed the uprising. And it wasn't until December of 1989 that once again, the Czechoslovak people went free. And then a few years later, in the year 1993, 94, I forget, Czechoslovakia split off into two different countries. So today we have the Czech Republic and Slovakia. So that's... 550 years of history, and I'd done a little bit of math, in between the year of 1450 and 2020, the people of the Czech Republic, the Czechs, the Bohemians, whatever we'd like to call them, they've been free and independent for exactly 50 years. That's it. 50 years between the year 1450 and the year 2020. That's it. That's not a lot. That's not even a whole lifetime if you added, uh, you know, all, all the years that lead up to that 50. But the Czech people, the Bohemians, with their rich and vibrant culture that we'll learn about over the course of this course, they have consistently loved to demonstrate their own independent thinking and culture and way of living. And sometimes they like to rebel against those authorities that have dominated them. And for most people in the Czech Republic today, and for many historians, that spirit of rebellion and independence goes back to this man. This is Jan Hus. He was a Bohemian priest. He became a priest in a nice even year of 1400. He studied at the University of Prague before that. Jan Hus, 
whose name is sometimes anglicized to how we see it here, John Hus. So Jan Hus was a priest who was inspired by an international movement of a small but significant group of Christians who really believed that being a good Christian did not entail simply following tradition and being obedient to church authorities, but rather by reading the Bible and having a more direct communication with God. A lot of this came out of the Great Plague, the Black Death of the year 1348, when nearly half the population of Europe was wiped out in a pandemic. And that, understandably, really shook people's faith up. Why is this happening? What is the meaning of my life? Why are all these people dying? Also, a lot of priests died in the Black Death, Black Death of 1348. So in terms of, their, in terms of spiritual matters, a lot of people were left on their own. A lot of very interesting, radical, new religious groups came out of the Black Death of 1348, as well as some new theologians with new ideas about what it meant to be a Christian, one of which came out of the Holy Roman Empire. His name was Thomas Akempis, and Thomas Akempis wrote about how you should discipline yourself to have your own spiritual connection with God, and really got into how you can do these, I guess what we could call meditative practices to develop a personal connection with God and how you can make yourself a better human being and a better Christian. His book on the imitation of Christ, which taught you how to live like Jesus lived. So you look at Jesus as an example of how you should live your own life. That became one of the most influential books in all of European history. And then another theologian who came out of England, who had a direct influence on Jan Hus here, was an Englishman, Englishman named John Wycliffe. Wycliffe, very similar to Thomas Akempis. Let Jesus be the greatest influence in your life. Not the church, not the priest, not even the pope. Rather, Jesus and what the Bible says. Wycliffe had to uh, leave England and live in hiding. His ideas permeated throughout Europe, and it had a direct influence on Jan Hus, who read Wycliffe, was very influenced by Wycliffe, and began preaching the same thing. At his church in Prague, Jan Hus preached that the church should return to its earlier days when priests, bishops, cardinals were not wealthy individuals, but in fact lived in poverty. That the people should be able to read the Bible on their own so that individual Christians could have a more direct relationship to God. Jan Hus was, like most famous ministers throughout history, an incredibly powerful orator that the people all wanted to come and listen to. It was, a, it was an exciting, new, lively form of Christianity that he was teaching. Not just you know a list of, here's rules that you should follow, here's what you should do. So he became immensely popular with the people of Prague who he was not popular with, were, of course, church officials. He seemed to be advocating, not seemed, he was advocating, dismantling the economic and political power of the church that he worked for. So, the cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church invited Jan Hus to discuss his ideas with them at an event known as the Council of Constance in the year 1415. Okay, so first of all, the cardinals. In the hierarchy of power in the Roman Catholic Church, you have the Pope, who's the head of the Roman Catholic Church, and then beneath the Pope, there are the cardinals. Now, in the year 1415, there were a lot of problems with the structure of the Roman Catholic Church. Namely, there were three individuals who both claimed that they were the rightful Pope. So in 1415, there were three popes. And to discuss how to solve this dilemma of there being three popes when there should be only one, the cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church held a council. And this council was held in the city of Constance. Constance is a city that's in the very southern part of Germany today. And it's, it's, it's along Lake Constance, which is a beautiful lake that is, it resides along the German-Swiss border today. 
And that was the purpose of the Council of Constance. It, the, the big purpose was not to deal with Jan Hus and his radical ideas, but rather to, to solve this crisis of, you know, there are three popes, which one's the real pope? But Jan Hus, who seemed at the time to be the figurehead of this wave, of this new way of thinking about Christianity, that people should read the Bible for themselves, that the church shouldn't be so powerful, that particular high-ranking church mem church members like priests and bishops and cardinals and even the Pope were doing sinful things and that the people shouldn't therefore trust the church authorities anymore. But those ideas had been building for a few decades now and Jan Hus seemed to be the figurehead and the apex of all that. And so while the Council of Constance was meeting, they invited, the cardinals invited Jan Hus to talk to them about his ideas as the cardinals themselves decided who was going to be the new pope and how the church was going to, I guess in a certain way, be reformed. Now, when Jan Hus was invited to Constance, Jan Hus's friends told him, do not go. This is dangerous. These men do not like you. After all, you are a threat to their power. These are some of the wealthiest, most powerful men in Europe, and you're going to tell them, hey, I believe you should actually be living in poverty because that's how Jesus lived. They're not going to want to hear this, and they may try to kill you, Jan Hus. But the cardinals had extended to Jan Hus something called safe conduct. In other words, they, weren't, they, they made the promise they weren't going to hurt Jan Hus. Safe conduct means you will safely pass from Prague to the city of Constance, we will hear what you have to say about Christianity, what your particular beliefs are, and then you will go safely home to Prague. That's the promise of safe conduct. Sounds great. But when Jan Hus showed up to Constance and he delivered his testimony on, here is what the church should do, this is how church authorities should behave, and all of this is based upon the Bible, the holy book of Christianity, the church authorities heard this, they determined that Jan Hus was a heretic, and Jan Hus was burnt alive at the stake. A, an extraordinarily painful death. When news of Jan Hus's death reached Bohemia, the people of Bohemia, many of them, called themselves Hussites after Jan Hus. They created an army, and they tried to break free from the Holy Roman Empire where they could have their own country and their own church that they considered to be more holy than the Roman Catholic Church and more based upon the teachings in the Bible. They'd go free, do their own thing. They were so angry at the treatment of Jan Hus, who they considered to be a martyr and a true Christian. And it was the establishment of the Roman Catholic Church that was evil. All right. Well, I don't have to tell you that the Hussite rebellion didn't work, that the imperial army of the Holy Roman Empire crushed the Hussite revolt, although it took him quite a few years to do so. But once again, Bohemia, back in the fold of the Holy Roman Empire. But even though politically they're controlled by the Holy Roman Empire, what do you think's going on in the hearts of the people of Bohemia? We don't like you. We want to be free. We want to do our own thing. We have our language, our culture, our way of thinking. And that spirit will remain in the hearts of the Bohemian slash Czech people throughout our telling of the story of European history. But for the story of the Reformation specifically, Jan Hus serves as an example. He was a priest. He believed strongly in the word of God as it is written in the Bible, and that the Bible is the final authority on anything. And he read the Bible, and he read about how Christians should behave, and then he looked at specific church practices and said, ah, the church isn't, they're, they're not doing Christian things. And he spoke out against the church doing those things and saying the church should be reformed. He was burnt alive by the Roman Catholic Church. The church condemned him as a heretic. Jan Hus and his many followers said he was actually just a good Christian. Jan Hus serves as the ultimate example in the following century to come that you may want to be careful in criticizing the Roman Catholic Church for not being Christian enough, for advocating certain practices 
that Jesus wouldn't have liked. Jan Hus served as an example that if you are a Christian, or especially if you are working for the Roman Catholic Church in the capacity of nun, monk, priest, bishop, archbishop, cardinal, you do what you are told or you pay the price. It's not your job to question. It's your job to believe and to do what you're told. And if not, you're a heretic and you burn to death. So that's the story of Jan Hus. The story of the Reformation, in particular the beginning of the Reformation, focuses around the Holy Roman Empire. So we're going to fast forward a hundred years after the death of Jan Hus in 1415. We're going to go into the early 16th century, and we're going to talk about who rules this land, the Holy Roman Empire. Now, the Holy Roman Empire was an expansive empire that controlled most of what we identify today as Central Europe. It's mostly German-speaking, but there are other cultures in there, such as the Bohemians. And even among the German speakers, it's important to know that there is no one single form of German. And in fact, even as you travel from one German land to another, the Germans, especially back then, did not necessarily understand each other. I mean, even today in the 21st century, if you are in Berlin and you speak the Berlin or the German that's in Berlin, which is the German, if you're taught German at Upper Arlington High School, that's the German that you're learning is high German. And you travel to the city of Cologne and you hear their German, which is called Kölner Deutsch. Man, they sometimes just don't understand what's being said. And then you travel down to Switzerland. It's a completely different, well, sort of diff a slightly different form of German. that's harder to understand. And so, and that's today in the 21st century, you go back to the 16th century, there's a wide variety of Germanic languages that are being spoken. Okay, but the Holy Roman Empire is this conglomeration of kingdoms throughout Central Europe. And hopefully you remember from a previous lecture that they have seven electors from the various regions throughout the Holy Roman Empire, and they select an emperor who helps to govern and unify them. In the early 16th century, we have as the ruler of the Holy Roman Empire, Maximilian I. Hopefully you remember from a previous lecture that throughout our entire telling of the story of European history, there is one family that is the imperial family that rules over the Holy Roman Empire. And that is the Habsburg family. And the Habsburg family comes out of Austria. Austria is but one kingdom that is part of the Holy Roman Empire at this point in time in history. And so the Habsburg emperor in the early 16th century, in the early 1500s, is Maximilian I. Maximilian's grandson is a young man named Charles. Charles was born in the nice even year of 1500. And that's nice for us who are students of history because uh, being born in the nice even year of 1500 helps us to know exactly how old Charles is at particular points of time in the 16th century. So when I tell you that Maximilian I dies in the year 1519 and his son Philip had already died and Charles then becomes emperor in the year 1519, it's hopefully very easy for you to figure out how old Charles was when he becomes the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. He was 19 years old. He will be Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire he plays a very important role during the era of the Reformation. I will spend quite a bit of time talking about him. So I have this particular image up here, the seven electors of the Holy Roman Empire. So it's important to know that you know, when Maximilian I died and Charles V became emperor, Charles V didn't necessarily automatically inherit the empire. That the electors who re represent very large regions in the Holy Roman Empire, these are men of incredible wealth and power they select who their emperor is going to be. And part of the deal is that the emperor respect the rights and privileges of each of these men. So just because you're emperor doesn't mean you can do whatever it is that you want to do. You know that you are emperor because these seven electors elected you to be an emperor. And these men, for the most part, have the right and the privilege to control their own lands. Now, I accentuate this now because what we're going to find is throughout the course of the 16th century, 
these seven electors are going to start splitting. There's going to be some of the electors who want to reform the church, and there's going to be some who do not want to see the church reformed, and there is going to be a split in the Holy Roman Empire, and Charles V is not going to want to see this split happening, and he's going to do whatever it takes to keep this split from happening. Okay, so let me continue to talk a little bit about Charles V here. Here is a family tree. We'll occasionally have to look at family trees just to help us make sense of European history from time to time. These family trees can be complicated when you first look at them, and that can be daunting, but they can also help explain a lot, and they can be fun as well. So um, let's start with two people on this family tree that you should know. If you go to the top left-hand side of this family tree, you see... Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile of Spain. You hopefully remember that, that it was Ferdinand and, and Isabella who got married, unifying Spain, drove out the last of the Muslim Moors from Spain in January of 1492, and then used some of the money from the conquest of Granada to finance the voyages of Christopher Columbus, thus opening up the Americas to to Spain, conquering the Americas, taking a whole bunch of gold and engaging in the conquest and the oppression, to say the least, of Native Americans. Okay, so that's Isabella and Ferdinand. Okay, so they had several uh, children, one of which is Joanna, or in Spanish, and I don't speak Spanish, by the way, students, but in Spanish, Joanna is Juana, and Juana of Castile and Aragon she married into the Habsburg line. Okay, so go to the top right-hand side of this family tree. And here we have the Holy Roman Emperor, Maximilian I. I don't have his last name up there, but hopefully you know it's Habsburg and that he is from the Habsburg Kingdom of Austria. He married a woman named Mary of Burgundy. Burgundy is Northwestern Europe. Think the Netherlands. So when these people get married, they unify their kingdom. So the Dutch lands of Mary are brought into the fold of the Holy Roman Empire when she marries Maximilian I. And they have a son, Philip. And Philip and Joanna, or Juana, they get married and Charles is their son. Now, sadly for Charles, his mom, Joanna, Joanna ended up becoming seriously mentally ill. She probably had something like schizophrenia. She had to be placed in a locked room. She was yelling, screaming, talking to people who weren't there. She is sadly remembered as Juana la Loca, Joanna the Mad. And I can only assume that made for a difficult boyhood for Charles to see his mom slowly lose her grip on reality. And certainly she couldn't be a mom to her son. Philip would also die young, Charles' dad. But understand that as you look here, you see Charles inherited a whole lot of land. He gets the entirety of the Holy Roman Empire, and he gets the entirety of Spain and all of Spain's conquests. Charles himself married into the Portuguese line, thus uniting all of the Iberian Peninsula. So as we look at this map, or these two maps, this is what Charles inherited. All of Spain's conquests in the New World, so you're talking about much of North America and much of South America and all of the resources and especially the mineral resources like, like gold that's being brought back to Spain from the New World. Technically, that belongs all to Charles V. And so then you look at the map of Europe, you've got uh, Spain and, and then right in Spain is right next to Portugal. They're not technically united yet, but Charles V's son will inherit both Portugal and Spain. And then you have all of the Holy Roman Empire. Oh yeah, and don't forget that Spain, you remember during the Renaissance, took over the southern part of Italy as well as Sicily and Sardinia. So he rules over all that as well. And then Charles's aunt, Joanna's sister, is Catherine of Aragon, and she's the Queen of England. Which doesn't mean that Charles V possesses England, but he certainly has a close tie to England. So this is what Charles V inherits when he is 19 years old, he is the wealthiest, most powerful man on earth. And he's 19. Hey, now, by the way, if I can just go back to the family chart here for just a second. As you see, this is just a little technic just a little technicality. He's Charles I of Spain because he's the first king of Spain who has the name Charles. But because he is also the Holy Roman Emperor, he's the fifth Charles. 
to be a Holy Roman Empire emperor. So he's Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire, and he's also Charles I of Spain, but he's the same guy. To keep things clear, I'm just going to call him Charles V, which is what most historians call him. All right, so Charles V, there he is. And the last thing I want to talk about with Charles V is something that seems rather silly, but it does affect history, and that's his chin. There it is, the Habsburg chin. It's big, he's got a big underbite, and that's worth noting. Teenagers tend to like to make fun of the Habsburg chin. Okay, that's fine if you want to do that. I'm pointing it out not to be cruel about the physicality of Charles V, but because there's so much inbreeding that happens in these royal lines in order to keep empires and kingdoms together. Cousins will marry cousins. And so this Habsburg chin grows until it's finally a physical defect. And we will eventually come up to a Spanish king who's the product of so much inbreeding that... First of all, he's mentally, he's, he's just an imbecile. He's got the brain of a small child and his jaw is so big he can't chew his own food. And that will cause a dynastic crisis and it will lead to a war. But we're not there yet. <laughs> right now, I just want you to see Charles V's chin. Okay, there's Charles V. Now, Charles V, as we get into the Reformation, he's the most powerful man in Europe. And to maintain his power, he believes it's important that all the people in his realm, and in particular the Holy Roman Empire, they all remain good Catholics. And by good Catholics, that means obedient to the structure of the Roman Catholic Church establishment. Do what the Catholic Church tells you to do. And that is Charles V. We'll be hearing a lot more about Charles V. All right, so let's finally talk about how this whole Reformation thing happened. Well, it began dramatically with greed for money and power. And specifically, this man's greed, Albrecht of Brandenburg. This man, because he wants to become an elector in the Holy Roman Empire, and because he's willing to bribe, borrow, and spend a whole bunch of money to achieve this goal of incredible power, he will set into motion a series of events. That will be the Reformation, arguably, arguably, the most transformative event in European history. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Way to go, Albrecht of Brandenburg. All right. So here's what happens. Albrecht of Brandenburg, he's a powerful man in the Holy Roman Empire, but he wants to be more powerful. He wants to be an elector. So he can become an elector by being appointed the Archbishop of Mainz. And the person who can do that is the Pope. And he gets the appointment from the Pope by bribing the Pope. He gave the Pope a whole bunch of money. Now, there's a specific term for this in the Roman Catholic Church. It's called simony. Simony is essentially a bribe that you pay church officials so that you can get appointed into a position of power. That's simony. And simony was very commonplace because really there was no prosecution of it and because it overall seemed good for the church. People in power in the Roman Catholic Church receiving money. But what you have happening is church offices being filled by not maybe the best Christians, but rather the ones with money. So anyway, Pope Leo X was the Pope that made Albrecht of Brandenburg the elector and the Archbishop of Mainz. Pope Leo X is our first Medici Pope. So here are the Medici yet again. Pope Leo X, you may remember, was the adopted son of Lorenzo the Magnificent. He was the biological son of Giuliano de' Medici, the younger brother who was assassinated in the 1478 Pazzi Conspiracy, the assassination that happened during the Easter Mass of 1478 in Florence. He's now the Pope, and this is the guy who accepted the bribe and bestowed upon Albrecht of Brandenburg the bishopric, if I said that right, the bishopric of Mainz. He made him Archbishop of Mainz. All right. Pope Leo X is remembered as not being a great pope because he financially mismanaged the Roman Catholic Church. He was himself a spendthrift. He probably could have lived a little less lavishly himself. But he did have, at the time, 
at least a good advertisement campaign for giving money to the Roman Catholic Church. And that was because he was continuing the development of this. This is a very famous structure in the world. This is St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. This is, of course, the Pope's Church. This is the largest cathedral in the entire world. The original St. Peter's Church was actually an old Roman pagan church going all the way back to Roman times. And then, I'm not exactly sure exactly when St. Peter's Basilica was, when construction began on it. I assume it was sometime in the 15th century, the 1400s. But construction is going on during the early 16th century when Pope Leo X is the Pope. Obviously, this is a very costly project to build this huge cathedral. You hopefully remember that Michelangelo designed that dome on top there. Okay, so Pope Leo, Pope Leo X, that is, he was encouraging donations to the Roman Catholic Church so that construction of St. Peter's Basilica could continue. So that seems to be a fairly noble cause. But also, you had Pope Leo X and other high-ranking church officials skimming a lot off the top of the funds that should have gone to St. Peter's Basilica for their own personal use. Okay, so Albrecht of Brandenburg paid Pope Leo X for his position as an elector. That was a bribe. That's called simony. Well, where did Albrecht of Brandenburg get this money from? As wealthy as he was, he did not have the personal wealth in his own coffers to pay the simony, to pay this bribe. So he had to borrow it. And the most powerful, the most significant banking family in Central Europe was the Fugger family. They operated out of Augsburg, which is in Bavaria, which is a, the state in southern Germany today. It's about, well, I don't know exactly how far, but it's near uh, Munich, which is the capital of Bavaria in the southern part of Germany, Augsburg. So the Fugger family, you can think of them as like the Medici family, the powerful banking family of Central Europe north of the Alps. So that's how Albrecht of Brandenburg got the money. He essentially went to the Fugger family, think of that, the Fuggers as a bank, gets the cash, transfers the cash to Pope Leo X. Now Albrecht of Brandenburg is Archbishop of Mainz. But now, of course, he has to pay the Fugger family back with interest, of course. So how is Albrecht going to pay back this loan? Well, now here's where things get fun. Albrecht of Brandenburg is going to hire a friar to essentially take money from all of the poor people in his land, or I guess I should say all of the commoners in the land. And this friar is going to, you know, keep some for himself. You know, he gets a cut, he gets a percentage, delivers that money to Albrecht of Brandenburg, who returns it to the Fugger family. So Albrecht of Brandenburg hires this friar. A friar is a monk who does not live in a monastery, but rather lives in a town or a village or travels from town to town, village to village, to teach and interact with the people. You can think of a, of, a, of a friar as sort of a traveling priest. Okay, and the friar that Albrecht of Brandenburg hired was a man named John Tetzel. So Tetzel's job is to get money for Albrecht of Brandenburg. Now, how Tetzel collects money for Albrecht of Brandenburg becomes very famous in the story of the Reformation. It was a practice called selling indulgences. Tetzel certainly was not the first person to sell indulgences. This is a practice that went all the way back to the 11th century when the Pope was trying to raise money for the Crusades. And how the selling of indulgences worked was like this. Being a good Catholic, you knew that Every sin that you committed in life counted against you. And there's nobody except for Jesus who's been able to live a life on earth and not commit some, smith, some sin, small or great. And so as a Catholic, you believe that when you die, you will eventually go to heaven, but you're going to spend some time in purgatory, which is this awful place. It's pretty much like hell. And you'll spend years and years and years there being burnt and tortured for all the sins that you've committed in life. And the period of time that you stay there is dependent upon, well, how many sins you committed in this life. And then after all of your sins are purged out of you, then you transcend and go to heaven. That is what you believed. Now, one of the things that you could do back then was buy an indulgence. So you gave money charitably to the church. 
you sacrificed some of your own hard-earned money and you gave it to the church. And in return, the church gave you this piece of paper. It's a certificate. This is the indulgence. And it says that because you gave charitably to the church, that was a good deed and your time in purgatory has been reduced. So that's what it was. In short, you could pay to have your sins forgiven. Sounds reasonable. The only thing is, there's absolutely nothing about this in the Bible. This is something that the popes, during the time of the Crusades, they made up as a way to collect funds for the Roman Catholic Church. So the selling of indulgences had been going on for several hundred years by the time we get to the early 1500s. And you had Friar John Tetzel going from town to town to town within the realm of Albrecht of Brandenburg. Friar Tetzel, and this is important to the story, he would not be allowed outside of the realm of Albrecht of Brandenburg. So he would not be allowed into the town of another elector only in the towns that belong to Albrecht of Brandenburg. Friar Tetzel would go from town to town to town to town, and he would famously put on a show. And his show was about people burning in hell, or people burning in purgatory. So let's remember, this is a day and age before movies or television or internet or even a whole lot of theater. So when Tetzel shows up to town, I mean, you'd want to see it. So he shows up to a village and he puts on this whole show with dramatizations of what your body is going to, or how your body is going to be tortured when you go to purgatory. And people see it and they're scared half to death. Who wants to be tortured and burnt? So they say, I, I don't want that. And so John Tetzel says, I have a way out here. Buy an indulgence. And you could buy one for yourself or... You could even buy one for other people. Maybe you just had a mother who passed away. She might be suffering in purgatory right now. Don't you want to release your mom out of purgatory? Send her up into heaven. Here, give us some money and you can have the indulgence and your mom can go to heaven. And just in case anybody wants to know, where is this money going? Tetzel tells them, this money is all going to lay stones for the construction of St. Peter's Basilica. Your money is helping to build the biggest cathedral in the world. What could be a, a more noble thing that you could do for your money than to help construct this incredible edifice for the glory of God? So Tetzel is a friar, but it's best to think of him like a salesman. I mean, he does a fantastic sales job. He even has, like modern commercials today, his own little jingles catchy little poetic phrases that he repeats over and over again, and they stick. People memorize them. So he would say famously, when a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. And that stuff works. That stuff worked in the early uh, 1500s. It works in the early 2000s. Catchy, simple phrases, little jingles. People hear that, they, they remember it, and it sticks. And that's a device that salespeople have used throughout history to get people to buy their stuff. So Tetzel was a successful salesman. He sold these indulgences. He collected a whole lot of money. He gets to keep a cut of that money for himself. So it benefits him to be a good salesman. And then, of course, this money is going to Albrecht of Brandenburg, who is paying back the Fugger family with interest. It's all great. Everything is working out splendidly. They're working out so splendidly, in fact, that people from other lands, lands that don't belong to Albrecht of Brandenburg, are coming into the lands of Albrecht of Brandenburg to see Tetzel to watch the show and to pay for an indulgence for themselves, or for themselves or their loved ones or whoever they want to release from purgatory. So it's working out splendidly, but remember, there's nothing in the Bible that can really justify the sale of indulgences. And that's where this man comes in, Martin Luther. Now, when we talk about all the many people we talk about in this course of European history, if we had to identify one person 
whose life had the most impact, whose life had the most significance in changing the course of history, it would probably have to be Martin Luther. This one man's life cannot be underestimated in terms of the impact that it has on world history. His beliefs and behaviors essentially helped to create modern Europe. What he, did, what he did was so monumentally big that I honestly find myself stumbling over my words trying to articulate just exactly how big Martin Luther is, how important he is. So why don't I just shut up and tell you what he did? Okay, so Martin Luther, first, know this, he was a monk who did not, I repeat, he did not live in the lands of Albrecht of Brandenburg. He lived in another area. He lived in the region of the Holy Roman Empire that we call Saxony. And Saxony had a king named Frederick the Wise. We'll learn more about him later. But Martin Luther was a monk. His biography is interesting. It, it gives us a sense of a little bit of what he was like. His dad wanted him to be a lawyer, so he grew up studying law. And then famously, one day he was outdoors walking home or something, and he got caught in a thunderstorm and lightning was crashing all around him during the thunderstorm. He was getting pelted with rain. And he got really scared at that moment that he was going to die. He felt as lightning and thunder were crashing around all around him that he thought God was trying to kill him or that he was going to die in some way. And so feeling that his life was in peril, he got down upon his knees, begged God to allow him to live, and that he, Martin Luther, would dedicate his life to God and become a monk. So he was going to renounce law and become a monk. And that's exactly what Martin Luther did, and he becomes one of the most devout and passionate monks and the entire history of Christianity. And you know, some historians and biographers have pointed to this transformative moment in Luther's life as being indicative of his mindset and his personality. I mean, if you were yourself caught in a thunderstorm, you know, it, it's a bad thunderstorm, and your rain's coming down hard, and let's say lightning is crashing all around you, and you know, maybe a tree nearby you gets struck, and it's really scary. You might be uncomfortable, you might be scared, but how many of you are going to think, wow, this is it, this is the end of my life and God's trying to kill me and I should renounce my future career and dedicate the rest of my life to God. You know, probably very few of us would, would have that reaction, but Martin Luther did. And certainly throughout <laughs> all of history, there have been many historians and even a few psychologists like a famous psychologist named Eric Erickson in the 20th century who tried to psychoanalyze Martin Luther to try to explain, here's how his mind worked, because it certainly worked differently from the rest of ours. He did, in his early years, really feel that he was never good enough for God, that he was going to die and go to hell. I have a feeling, if Martin Luther were a student in Upper Arlington High School as a teenager, he'd be the type of kid who would constantly be studying, constantly be asking the teacher, what more can I do? What more can I do? Oh, this essay isn't good enough. I'm not taking enough AP classes. I constantly have to be better, whatever. Like that, that's kind of, based upon the description of biographers and historians today, like what Martin Luther was like. He just had this intensity to him, but that an intensity for, a long, for at least his early adulthood seemed to come out of a deep anxiety that he simply wasn't good enough and that he constantly had to strive to be better and better. Okay, but so Martin Luther decides to become a monk. Uh, famously, when he becomes a monk, he takes a pilgrimage to Rome. So this was something that you had to do as a German monk. You had to walk from your town, which for Martin Luther was the town of Wittenburg in Saxony, all the way down to Rome. This would have taken a couple of months. I, I don't know specifically how long, but a few months. And you weren't allowed to take anything with you, so you had to beg along the way. So you had to live, well, you had to live like Jesus. You had to live in poverty. And you had to rely upon the kindness of strangers as you made this incredible pilgrimage over the Alps down into Italy and to, into Rome. And when Martin Luther gets to Rome, he's disgusted. He would have been there during the papacy of Pope Julius II on the streets of Rome, he saw the worst of humanity. He saw people selling relics. That was a popular thing back then. He saw drunkenness. He saw prostitution. And he thought, you know, this is supposed to be the city of God. This should be the most holy city. 
with the most holy living. And there was something about this trip to Rome that really disgusted Martin Luther. Back home in Wittenberg, Luther would have been educated in the tradition of St. Aquinas, the scholastic tradition, where he would have been asked to memorize a great deal of information. But the humanist tradition was also picking up the humanist tradition of, you know, the northern humanist tradition of Erasmus, where there was more dialogue and debate. And Martin Luther very much got into that new humanist tradition and liked to debate people, including his professors. And he reveled in you know, constructing an argument and defending the argument. And that was part of the humanist tradition. And the fact that Martin Luther was simply so good at that, he knew so much of the Bible, he was such a diligent student, and he got so good at discussion and debate, all this really sets him up for his response to the selling of indulgences. So, okay, remember, Martin Luther comes from the Saxony region of the Holy Roman Empire. His king is Frederick the Wise. Frederick the Wise is one of the seven electors. Okay, so Tetzel is not coming to the same town where Luther is, but Luther finds out about many, many, many people from his town of Wittenberg and, the, and, and other towns in Saxony that are going across the border into Albrecht of Brandenburg's lands to hear Tetzel, you know, preach whatever he preached about indulgences and put on that show and then give their money to Tetzel and they get their indulgences back and they come back and they show these indulgences to Martin Luther. So Martin Luther got to see these indulgences. And Luther, upon finding out about these indulgences, knowing that there's nothing in the Bible to support this, seeing that it's mostly peasants, the poor people who shouldn't be giving their money away at all to anybody, they need that money for food, that they are giving money to this Tetzel guy. Man, Luther just gets fired up with this righteous indignation. And Luther doesn't hesitate. I am going to fight this. So what Martin Luther does as a monk is he writes. He composes one of the most important documents in all of European or even world history, the 95 Theses. Okay, the 95 Theses are 95, as you would guess, thesis statements concerning how the selling of indulgences is not supported by the Bible. In other words, the indulgences, they're simply pieces of paper. They're worthless. And the money that you give to the church does not in any way absolve you of your sins. So 95 theses, thesis statements against the selling of indulgences. We remember these as the 95 theses. All right, if you can't hear, take a minute to look at this particular image. This is the image of Martin Luther in the 95 Theses. This image is historically inaccurate, even though it's one of the most iconic images of European history. Uh, what you supposedly see Martin Luther doing here is nailing his copy of the 95 Theses to the church door in the town of Wittenberg. Now, why would anybody nail things to the church door? Because you see there's several things nailed to the church door. Well, because the church door, these big, heavy wooden doors on those old churches, they served as essentially bulletin boards for the community. And he wanted the people of Wittenberg to you know, know about the 95 Theses so they could come and when they came to the church, as they inevitably did. They would read the 95 Theses and decide, okay, it's silly for me to give my money to buy an indulgence. Now, it's important to know, it's slightly important to know, Martin Luther never actually did this. He did not go to the door of Wittenberg and nail his 95 Theses to the door of Wittenberg. Now, his 95 Theses actually may have been placed on the church door at, Witten, at Wittenberg, but that's not what Martin Luther did. Martin Luther wrote his 95 Theses as a letter. So the 95 Theses are actually originally a letter to... Albrecht of Mainz, Albrecht of Brandenburg and Mainz, rather. Luther wrote to him, the boss of Tetzel, telling him, hey, there's this monk going, or there's this friar, Friar Tetzel, who's going around your lands selling indulgences. He cannot do this. There's no nothing to support this practice from the Bible. What he is doing is unchristian and wrong. This letter was dated October the 31st, 1517, which 
some people consider to be the very first day of the Reformation. And we, as in, in, in the United States, look upon October the 31st as Halloween, the last day of October. In Germany, uh, it is celebrated as Reformation Day, traditionally. Traditionally, today, in Germany, they celebrate October the 31st as Reformation Day, especially in the Saxony region of Germany. And in the year 2017, they actually closed school uh, for a long five-day-long weekend. So they closed school for three days so they could have a five-day weekend in celebration of the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's 95 Theses. So October the 31st, 1517, that was the date that Martin Luther sent his letter. Now, when Albrecht of Brandenburg receives the letter and hears this Nobody, this no-name monk from a neighboring region, telling him, Albrecht of Brandenburg, hey, you better stop this Friar Tetzel guy because what he's doing is not Christian and can't be supported from the Bible. I mean, you can, you can only imagine what goes through Albrecht of Brandenburg's mind. He's like, I, I don't care. I just want the money. And don't tell me to stop Friar Tetzel. He's giving me the money that I need to pay back the Fugger family. Now, so if Martin Luther had lived in the lands of Albrecht of Brandenburg, Martin Luther probably would have died just right then and there. He probably would have been rounded up by one of Brandon, Albrecht's knights, and he would have been thrown in some dungeon somewhere, and that would have been it for, um, for Martin Luther. But Martin Luther lived in the Saxony region. He was a subject of Frederick the Wise. So what Albrecht of Brandenburg eventually did was, in order to shut up Martin Luther, he reached out to the Pope, because the Pope has it within his authority to send the Inquisition up into Saxony to place Martin Luther on trial for being a heretic, because Luther is openly challenging an accepted practice in the Roman Catholic Church. And Martin Luther will either have to recant, which is to retract what he said because and to admit wrongdoing, or possibly get put to death like Jan Hus was put to death a century before. So that's what Albrecht of Brandenburg did. That was his response. But Martin Luther, whether or not he actually tacked up the 95 Theses to the door of Wittenberg doesn't matter. Those 95 Theses were copied and spread around all of the Holy Roman Empire. And this highlights the importance of this piece of technology developed in the early 1450s in the German states, Gutenberg's printing press. Because of the printing press, Martin Luther's 95 Theses could be mass-produced and mailed off to all corners of Europe so that people could read and discuss the legitimacy of selling indulgences. Now, the impact of the printing press, coupled with the 95 Theses, was immediate on the revenue Tetzel and Albrecht of Brandenburg were collecting. Peasants heard the 95 Theses read to them. They're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You mean that these indulgences, they mean nothing? You mean that we're just being ripped off? This incites an anger. And this anger will eventually, down the road, lead to an immense amount of bloodshed within the Holy Roman Empire. It'll lead to war. Okay, but right now, though, in 1517, in late 1517, let's think about why the peasants who've paid for indulgences are angry. So this friar came to town representing Albrecht and Brandenburg, but telling them that their money was going to go to the church in Rome, St. Peter's Basilica. And so you gave your money, your money, and you're a peasant. You don't have a lot of money to give. And so you feel ripped off. Now, who is ripping you off? Part of it you might feel is Albrecht of Brandenburg. So essentially the prince of your region. So you don't like him. He's the one who is ungodly. He's encouraging this ungodly practice so that he can collect our money. And my goodness, he lives in a castle and we're out here in straw huts. So there's anger towards him. There's also anger towards Rome. And that is significant too. Here's where you get into this cultural ethnic divide. A lot of the German speaking people are angry that they are controlled by Italians. And there's this feeling that our money is being stolen from us and it's going down to these Italians. There's also the stereotype that in, among the Germans that you know we as Germans are kind of hardworking, tough people. And the Italians 
oh, well, they just live this decadent lifestyle. For them, it's all wine and women and basking in the Mediterranean sun down south. And this, this sort of cultural uh, antagonism feeds into their religious views, too, that we Germans are more Christian. We live more Christ-like lives than those drunken, lusty Italians down south. So understand those attitudes that are held by the German peasants who've paid for these indulgences. When they finally get so angry that they're willing to fight, when they're willing to rise up against the system, understand that these, in, these prejudices are going to become unleashed. We don't like Albrecht of Brandenburg, and we don't like the church in Rome. Okay, but what's going to happen to Martin Luther? Well, that all depends upon this man, a member of the Wetten dynasty, the ruling family of Saxony. This is the lord of the land in which Martin Luther lives, Frederick the Wise. This is the guy who holds Martin Luther's fate in his hand. So as we consider Frederick the Wise and his position in the role of the Reformation right now, it's, this is one of those times where I, I sort of want to pause and pull back and encourage you to put yourself into the shoes from a person, from a person in history. If you were Frederick the Wise, what would you do? So you have this subject. His name is Martin Luther. He's a monk in Wittenberg. You've never heard of him before. He's a nobody, but he's written a letter to the elector. So he's essentially one of your equals in a neighboring land, Albrecht of Brandenburg. Now, you're not necessarily friends with Albrecht of Brandenburg, but you certainly have to acknowledge that he is your political equal within the hierarchy of the Holy Roman Empire. And Albrecht of Brandenburg is mad as hell that he is now no longer collecting the funds that he was once collecting because Martin Luther has unleashed the 95 Theses throughout Europe. So nobody is buying indulgences anymore. Albrecht of Brandenburg still has to give money back to the Fugger family. Now, there's not much you can do about the collection of indulgences, but you're certainly under pressure from Albrecht of Brandenburg to have Martin Luther pay, to have him killed, tortured, thrown in a dungeon, something like that. And then you, there's the Pope. There's the establishment of the, of the Roman Catholic Church, and everybody, pretty much everybody in Europe, certainly you as a, as a king or, or as the ruler of Saxony, you're going to want to respect the, Holy, the, the Roman Catholic Church, and they want to see Martin Luther put on trial for heresy, tried as a heretic. And you know what that means for Martin Luther, it, most likely death. He's going to get burnt at the stake, just like Jan Hus. So if you were Frederick the Wise, what would you do? So... You know, just take a moment to think about that. Think about, is there any benefit for you personally in supporting Martin Luther, in protecting Martin Luther? And if so, what would that benefit be? So as you take a moment to think about that, you might be able to guess that if you, for most people who are in the situ, in the position of Frederick, at this point of time, the easy thing to do would simply be to turn Martin Luther over, which would simply mean having him placed on trial as a heretic uh, and condemned, most likely placed or, or, or put to death, and then all is well, status quo restored, and you know maybe all is then well with the world, or at least with the with the status quo. But you also might probably be guessing at this point of time that. Frederick the Wise is not going to go along with these things. And this is, in fact, why we call him Frederick the Wise today. He saw a way <clears throat> to manipulate this situation to work for his benefit and for the benefit of some of the other electors. The one thing that Frederick the Wise was keenly aware of was the fact that Martin Luther had ignited a fire. Thanks to the 95 Theses and the printing press, the peasants of Saxony were fired up they were angry. They were mad as hell. And, and it wasn't just Saxony. It was spreading throughout, throughout the Holy Roman Empire and eventually Europe. People are angry about this whole indulgence situation that was going, in, in, going on in the lands of Albrecht of Brandenburg in particular, but it had been happening throughout Europe, you know, for centuries. So the people are fired up. They're angry. And Frederick the Wise 
being the ruler of these people, senses the, the momentum of history moving with them. And he feels that there's a way that he can personally exploit this to benefit himself and possibly the people of Saxony. So what does he do? Well, we're going to have to wait for just a moment to find out. So Martin Luther was fairly lucky in terms of 1517 being the year that he found out about the indulgences and published the 95 Theses in October of that year, because the leadership of the Holy Roman Empire, the emperor, the Habsburg emperor, was an elderly man who was dying at the time. That was Maximilian I. And so there might have been a more swift response if Maximilian were younger or if he had died earlier, but he dies in 1519, which is two years after the 95 Theses, and that's when 19-year-old Charles V becomes the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. So when Charles V takes the throne and becomes the Holy Roman Emperor, he fairly quickly wants to deal with this Martin Luther situation and nip it in the bud. Over the course of those two years, in between 1517 and 1519, the printing press had spread the 95 Theses, and his ideas were really picking up. So Charles V cooperating with the Roman Inquisition, which places people on trial for heresy, holds a trial for Martin Luther. And this trial, which happened in 1521, is known as the Diet of Worms. Now, if you remember from a previous lecture, the word Diet is a meeting of the seven electors of the Holy Roman Empire. And Worms is a city in uh, Germany. It is not in Saxony. It is outside of Saxony, which made it dangerous for Martin Luther. Of course, when a lot of us, you know, see this, see the name of this trial, we giggle because what we read as, you know, Americans is the Diet of Worms. That sounds like an, a, a disgusting dare that I would have done like back in the eighth grade or something, the Diet of Worms. But no, this is the Diet of Worms. So yeah, hopefully you understand what that means now. Okay, so the Roman Inquisition and Charles V summon Martin Luther to the town of Worms where Luther is going to stand trial for heresy. Now, one of the things that Frederick the Wise does is he reaches out to his emperor, Charles V. Now, Charles V is 21 years old right now, because it's 1521, and probably like uh, most young men who are new at their job, I would assume that Charles V was very energetic and very willing to prove himself as a great, powerful Christian emperor who will not tolerate any heresy in his land whatsoever. And, but Frederick the Wise, who's much older than Charles V, he asks Charles V for, get this, safe conduct for Martin Luther. And Charles V promises safe conduct for Martin Luther. That means Martin Luther will be allowed to travel in safety from Wittenberg to Worms, Stand trial, he'll be judged accordingly, and then he can go home. And here's where you get into the power dynamic between one of the home, one of the electors of the Holy Roman Empire and the emperor. Because the emperor is the emperor because he was elected emperor by the electors. And in return, the elector must respect the privileges and the rights of the electors. So even though Charles V is the emperor, he has to respect Frederick the Wise's power and control over his own subjects. And Frederick the Wise reiterates this when he demands that Martin Luther have safe conduct. And that's our first big hint that Frederick the Wise isn't just going to go along with the Roman Catholic Church and Charles V and throw Martin Luther under the bus. So, okay, when Martin Luther stands before Charles V and the Roman Inquisition, his books are laid out in front of him. The titles are, of these books are identified. They are named for Martin Luther, and he is first asked, are these your books? And Martin Luther responds positively, they are all mine. I am the author of these works. Then he is told that the Roman Catholic Church has identified these works as works of heresy, and that he is expected to, and this is a very important word, to recant. To recant is to take it back to admit what you wrote or said was wrong, and to accept whatever punishment or penance the Roman Catholic Church gives you. If you don't recant, then you are condemned as a heretic and likely, well, not likely, definitely, you will be excommunicated, which means you get kicked out of the Roman Catholic Church, and then likely you're going to be executed. You're going to be killed. 
The trial actually went on for a couple of days because the first time Martin Luther was asked to recant, uh, he asked for an additional additional time to think about it. Uh, the Inquisition mocked him over this, but they did, in the end, kindly give Martin Luther another day to consider whether or not he wanted to recant. And Martin Luther famously spent a lot of time talking to himself in the bathroom. Uh, historians and biographers have had a lot of fun with this. Martin Luther, according to his own testimony, spent a lot of time in the bathroom confronting Satan. Supposedly, he would have these one-on-one -on -one interactions with the devil, and it was in the bathroom where Martin Luther would uh, have these confrontations with the devil and also pray to God. There is also, in Martin Luther's references, a lot of references to poop, but I'm not going to spend any time talking about that. If you're interested in that stuff, though, hey, go look it up. There's a lot of stuff out there. There's a book called A World Lit Only by Fire by the American historian William Manchester, and Manchester spends a few pages talking about Martin Luther's obsession with poo. But I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just simply going to report that Martin Luther spent some time in the bathroom alone, confronting the devil, praying to God, and then returns to the Diet of Worms for day two of his Inquisition. And when asked to recant, Martin Luther eventually says this. Unless I am convinced by proofs from scriptures or by plain and clear reasons and arguments, I cannot and I will not recant, for it is neither safe nor wise to do anything against conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. Of all the things Martin Luther said and wrote throughout his lifetime, and he said and wrote a lot, it is probably the most famous phrase he ever uttered, and the last part of it, some people contest he never said it. But it's, a, it's an amazing statement that I would like to pick apart a little bit. Now, first of all, what you get here is Martin Luther did not recant. If you were in Martin Luther's shoes, and you know what happened to Jan Hus, and no doubt Martin Luther was thinking a lot of Jan Hus. You know, he might have been thinking a little bit about Savonarola as well. Savonarola had been burnt at the stake, well hung and then burnt at the stake, what, just a little over 20 years before this. So he knows, he, he knows very clearly what the, what the consequences of him not recanting are going to be. And that's probably why he wanted another day and to just, you know, deal with things alone in the bathroom. You know, what do you choose? you know, following your conscience and your beliefs and therefore death or avoiding death, just getting punished and then get to go on with the rest of your life. That's, that's, a, that's an awful choice to have to make. But here we see the strength of Martin Luther's character and his in a sense of righteousness and being willing to face death. And not just death, but torture, one of the worst deaths possible, being burnt alive. I mean, what would you personally be willing to say, no, this I believe and face being burned alive for? There's probably not a lot. Most of us would choose life over a belief, but not Martin Luther. So this particular quote, I, I, like I said, I want to take it apart a little bit because there's a lot packed in here that helps us to understand Martin Luther and the role he plays in history. First of all, you see the culmination of the Renaissance and humanism and especially, and especially the influence of those Northern humanists like Thomas More and Erasmus in this statement. So Martin Luther is essentially having to make a choice about what he believes in. Is, does he trust just the authority of the church? Is he going to be obedient to just the authority of the church? Or is he going to be obedient to the word of God, the Bible, and his own ability to interpret the word of God on his own? So that's why he says, unless I am convinced by proofs from scriptures, scriptures, Okay, that's the first thing he says. So in other words, you have to prove me wrong using the Bible. You can't just say that what I said with the 95 Theses and all that is wrong because the Pope says it's wrong, or that this is just the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. I need to see a proof from the Bible. The Bible is the ultimate word of God. So you have to use the Bible. Okay, and then he says, by proofs from scripture, scriptures or by plain and clear reasons and arguments, Okay, so there he's talking about logic, rational, logical thinking. So this is Northern humanism. Northern humanism, as really developed by Thomas More and Erasmus, is the Bible plus logic. 
and the Bible and logic should be the guide for your life. And that's why Martin Luther begins, you have to convince me that what I did is wrong based upon the scripture, the Bible, and clear reasons and arguments, logic. And then he says, you know, if you can't do that, which obviously they did not to Luther's satisfaction, he said, I cannot and will not recant. This particular translation has it as retract. Obviously, this is being translated from a Latin and part of it in German. And he says, I will not recant because it is neither safe nor wise to go against conscience. So Luther says, and I'll just paraphrase here, I can't say what I did was wrong because I don't feel like what I did was wrong. I acted in a way that I thought was right. I have a conscience and I must be obedient to my conscience. It's not right to go against my own conscience. It's not right to do something that I feel is wrong. Now that, first of all, if we want to take it way back, that goes back to Plato. Plato, that Greek philosopher who said that this world this physical world that we see with our eyes, this is not the real world. The real world is the spiritual world. And you have intuitive access to the spiritual world. Also, this idea of conscience, that goes back to those Christian theologians that came out of, uh, out of the Black Death, out of the Great Plague of 1348. Individuals like Thomas Akempis and John Wycliffe. This idea that you personally, individually have access to God that you don't need the church as an intermediary. So when Luther says it's neither right nor safe to go against conscience, he's saying to the church, I as an individual who have read the Bible, who have logic, and who has an intuitive sense of what's right and what's wrong, I'm more right than you and all of your power and all of your tradition and all of your authority. Those were bold things to say. And he pretty much just condemned himself. And then the final few sentences here. He then says, here I stand, I can do no other, God help me, amen. Now, it is possible that those last uh, few sentences, those last few short sentences, he didn't say, but rather in the story of the Dieta of Worms, those words were written in later. But the trial, which was conducted by the Roman Catholic Church, would have been conducted in Latin. And supposedly Martin Luther said this in German, this last, these last few sentences. So, here stehe ich, ich kann nicht anders, Gott hilf mir, Amen, in German. Thus a little bit of, you know, Saxon pride as he's being interrogated by the, uh, uh, the, the Roman Inquisition, and they were all Italian. So who knows if he ever said the here I stand bit, but... It certainly has become famous, especially in Germany. Okay, so if we could pause history at this moment here in 1521, it seems like Martin Luther is going to end up exactly like Jan Hus. He's going to be uh, captured and executed, and there's going to be another one of these Christian martyrs. But the story gets a little bit fun, because Frederick the Wise had forced Charles V to promise safe conduct, so Martin Luther gets to go home first before he receives any summons to Rome or something like that, where he'll likely get executed. So it's on this trip back from Wittenberg, or I'm sorry, from Worms to Wittenberg, where Martin Luther gets attacked and captured by bandits who appeared out of the woods. So Luther never makes it home to Wittenberg. These bandits that capture him, they throw a sack over his head. They take him off to a castle. Martin Luther, I'm sure at this moment, just knows, well, I'm going to die. This is it. These bandits are probably in the pay of Charles V, who just wants me dead. Maybe Albrecht of Brandenburg. Maybe the Pope. Who knows? But this is it. I'm going to die. But amazingly for Martin Luther, when he finally gets to the castle and the sack is removed from his head, he gets to see that one of his captors is a man by the name of George Spalatin. Spalatin was the personal secretary of Frederick the Wise. And Spalatin informed Martin Luther that too many people wanted him dead, Martin Luther knows this, but that Frederick the Wise wanted him kept alive and therefore was going to keep Martin Luther in hiding. So for two years, Martin Luther was kept hidden in Wartburg Castle. Here's Wartburg Castle today which is a pretty cool-looking castle, if you ask me. <laughs> it was at this time that Martin Luther was tucked away in Wartburg Castle for two years that most of the world who doesn't see Martin Luther again, they just assume he got killed by somebody. Now, 
While Martin Luther is tucked away in Wartburg Castle, he has a very difficult job to do. He began the process of translating the entire Bible, Old Testament and New, into German. Now, all the way back, a hundred years before, John Wycliffe from England, Jan Hus from Bohemia, both of those individuals had advocated for a Bible being translated into the vernacular. Vernacular simply means the language of the people. So in France, the Bible should be in French. In Spain, it should be in Spanish. In England, English, and so on and so forth. Now, why was that so important? So that everyday ordinary people could hear the word of God and understand it for themselves, that they wouldn't need a priest or the Roman Catholic establishment to tell them, here's what's in the Bible. Our masses are in Latin. You're not really going to understand what's said. You're just going to have to trust us and our eminence and authority. And those church reformers like Wycliffe and Hus said, no, no, no. People who need to hear the word of God for themselves. Going along with the ideas of Thomas Akempis, this would allow individual Christians to have a personal connection to God. Now for Martin Luther and for Frederick the Wise, if people can read the Bible for themselves, or if illiterate, have it read to them, and they can hear the word of God, then they can know for themselves, here's exactly what is in the Bible, and they can know that there's no such thing as indulgences. Heck, there aren't any, there isn't even any reference in here to popes or cardinals or bishops or even a whole church establishment as the Roman Catholic Church had been set up. And so having a Bible in the vernacular would be truly a revolutionary thing. The Word of God would undermine the Roman Catholic Church as it was in the early 16th century. Martin Luther spent an incredible amount of time, the first two years in Wartburg Castle was just the beginning, of translating the Bible into the German language. And the Luther Bible is a very important document in European history for several reasons. First of which, it's going to inspire many German people to revolt against the Roman Catholic Church and to start their own church, a Reformed church inspired by Martin Luther, so it will be called the Lutheran Church. So it's important for that reason. But it's also an important work of literature in the same way that Dante's Divine Comedy was important in the history of Italy. Just like the Italians in the early you know, 1300s spoke a wide variety of Italian dialects, because Dante's Divine Comedy was such an incredible bestseller, it standardized the Italian language. Dante's Florentine language, or Dante's Florentine Italian, becomes then the standard Italian. That's what Martin Luther's Bible does throughout the German-speaking world. It makes his German, the German they spoke in Saxony, the standard German language. So now if you're at Upper Arlington High School and you study German, uh, and your German teachers might tell you about this, you speak a type of German called Hochdeutsch, or High German. And the reason why you study that is because that is the standard German, and the reason why that's the standard German is because of this book, Luther's Bible. And if you become fluent at this type of German, and you travel throughout Germany, you'll notice that when you go to places like Cologne, or down to Switzerland, or Bavaria, or Austria, that sometimes it can be hard to understand people because there's still today a wide variety of dialects of German. But if you're in the region of Saxony, you know, if you're in Dresden, you understand their German just fine, as well as up in, you know, Berlin or Hamburg or Bremen or any other place where high German is the, is the standard German that's being spoken. So it does that too. Okay, but then there's another thing that this book does, and this reflects both a prejudice and a goal of Martin Luther and Frederick the Wise. So Martin Luther is going to translate the Bible. If you ever have to translate, it's a very difficult thing to do. You know, two different languages don't just have like two different words that mean the same thing. And learning a different language is just learning a whole new vocabulary. It doesn't work like that. If you're fluent in multiple languages, you know that ideas are expressed metaphorically. There's different ways of phrasing things that just simply do not translate. So, for example, this is a really dumb example, but it's the first one I can think of. If I say in English, 
that guy's nuts. Well, you know exactly what I mean. You mean that he's acting in some way that's crazy. But I mean, that phrase, that doesn't, <laughs> literally, that doesn't make any sense. That guy is nuts. I mean, you can't translate that directly. If you're speaking German, just because I speak a little bit of German, I know that if you want to say somebody's crazy, you could say, er hat ein Vogel, which means he's got a bird. And what the Germans mean metaphorically is a person has a bird flying around in their head if they're acting insane. But that doesn't make any sense to us in English. Hey, that guy's got a bird. <laughs> You'd be like, okay, I don't see that guy have holding a bird. What, the, what would that mean if he did? It just doesn't work, right, in terms of translation. So when you translate things, you have to take liberties, right? You have to capture the spirit of what is being said, but you're going to phrase things in a different way. So as Martin Luther translated the Bible, you know, the, the New Testament written mostly in Greek, as he translated the Bible from Greek into German, did Martin Luther take any liberties? Did he phrase things in a, in a particular way to maybe make his own individual theological or social or economic perspective the standard? Well, yes, he did. And he did in one way, which I find an incredibly brazen thing to do. Here's what Martin Luther did. So in Paul's first letter, letter to the Corinthians, chapter 14, verse 11, there is the word, the Greek word, barbarian. Now, this is a fantastic word <laughs> in Greek history. The Greeks thought of all people that didn't speak the Greek language, they called them barbarians. And this is literally because what the Greeks heard was something like bar, 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 when they heard these foreigners talking. So they called them barbarians. So that's a cool word with, some, with a cool etymological history. What's really interesting is how Luther interpreted, or rather translated, this word. For the word barbarian, he used the word undeutsch, which in German means not German. So in other words, for the German people who are reading about biblical times, barbarians are anybody who are not Germans, which makes the Lutheran Bible extraordinarily nationalistic, even though that concept of nationalism really isn't around yet. But what you have is the prejudice of the people of Saxony and throughout the northern part of, well, mostly Europe, but the, is the Holy Roman Empire. This is a sentiment that had been developed throughout uh, the Renaissance era in Northern Europe. This was Christian humanism, Northern humanism. This sense that we, and in this case, the we being the Saxon people of the Holy Roman Empire, were more Christian than everybody else. Who are the barbarians? Well, they're the people who aren't German, namely the Italians. So as the Reformation takes hold in Saxony and throughout uh, the northern part of the Holy Roman Empire, and as these regions break away from the Roman Catholic Church, and specifically the central governance of that church in Rome, there is very much a sense that we're doing this for our own people. We Germans have been under the control of those Italians for too long. We're going to be our own kingdom of our own people we're going to be free from those Catholic Italians, and we, we are the true Christians. And, and so, even though that concept of nationalism doesn't really come around until late 18th century, really early 19th century, hopefully you understand that, that there is sort of a nationalist or the spark of nationalism in the Reformation. In Saxony, there's a sense that we're the true Christians. We will see this repeated again when we talk about how the Reformation affects England and the Church of England is created. There's a very similar sentiment when that happens. Okay, so we're going to look at another passage in the Bible and see how Martin Luther translated it. And you might think this is just a small technical thing and not really, not really anything too sensational. Certainly nothing like calling a barbarian a non-German. It's a, just a small little tweak, but it did have some important consequences in terms of the Reformation. So this particular passage comes from the book of, uh, of Romans, which is the letter of Paul to the Romans, chapter 3, verse 28. And the statement says this, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. 
And Luther, when he writes his translation of this phrase, he writes it pretty, it's a pretty faithful translation, but he added a word. Martin Luther added the word alone after the word faith. So in the original German, uh, the word alone in German is allein. So you have allein durch den Glauben, alone through faith. Uh, the English translation is man is justified through faith alone. Okay, so what's this mean? What's the big deal here? Well, this is a small theological thing that you have to know about in AP European history. The significance of this is how an individual gets into heaven. So what enables you to get into heaven? What type of Christian do you have to be? Does just any Christian get into heaven? Well, first of all, Martin Luther says there's nothing in the Bible that says anything about purgatory. So when you die, you either go to heaven or you go to hell. There's nothing to suggest purgatory. Luther says that is something that is made up by the Roman Catholic Church. And no matter how logical a concept of purgatory might be, there's nothing in the Bible to support it. This according to Martin Luther. Okay, so what gets an individual into heaven? And Luther translates the Bible in such a way that what gets you into heaven is faith alone. In other words, all you have to do is believe that Jesus saved you, that you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's it. That gets you into heaven. You just have to believe. So in other words, it doesn't matter what you do in life. The, what's written here, the deeds of the law don't count. What gets you into heaven is your faith. So this is known as the principle of sola fide, and that's Latin, or justification by faith alone. And it becomes a central tenet of the new Lutheran religion and of many Protestant faiths that follow. And it's something that the Roman Catholic Church during the, during the period of time of, of, of the Reformation is going to strongly strike back at. Because the Catholic theologians do not read the Bible like this. And the Roman Catholic Church advocates that you can't just have faith alone. You must have faith and good works. Okay, so allow me to dramatize this a little bit. So, let's say you're a human being here on earth, and in your pursuit to find out the meaning of life, you decide that Christianity is it. That's the religion for you. So, pretty much doesn't matter which you know, sect of Christianity or which Christian church you belong to, the first thing you have to do as a Christian is to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You admit that you've done sinful things and that those, you know, sinful things are bad things, but that Jesus died for your sins, so you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And by doing that, that's the first thing you do to become a Christian and therefore to go to heaven when you die and to have what Christianity promises, which is eternal life. Okay, so Luther would say, no, wait, let me, let me not stop there. Okay, but, but then you go on and you live your life and you inevitably do some bad things. You lie, you cheat, and then let's say you do something really bad. Let's say you murder a person. So you kill another human being, which, which in the Catholic tradition is a mortal sin. It means you're going to hell when you die. Okay, so this person who lives on earth, who's a Christian, they kill somebody and they've done some bad things. Do they get to go to heaven when they die? Martin Luther. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Why? Because they accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Faith alone. Faith alone. Roman Catholic perspective. No, the person does not get to go to heaven. First of all, they did some very bad things. That's going to land them in purgatory for at least a certain period of time. And then murder. That's a mortal sin. That means you never get into heaven. So it's not faith alone. It's faith and good works. That's what gets you into, into heaven. But Martin Luther would say no. It doesn't matter if you've committed small sins or big sins. Who are we to judge other people? God has loved and forgiven us all. Everybody goes to heaven who is a Christian. Roman Catholics say, no, that does not make sense. If you say you truly believe that you are a Christian, you must act accordingly. So, this sets up a theological dispute between Martin Luther and his Lutheran religion and many other Protestant religions that follow out of Lutheranism and the Roman Catholic Church in terms of what gets you into heaven. For Luther, it's faith alone. For the Catholics, it's faith plus good works. Why is Luther all hung up on this? Well, you remember how I said that Martin Luther was very intense 
He was constantly working hard to be a good Christian. He never felt that he was good enough in the eyes of God. He had a moment when he was reading the Bible at some point in time in his career, and it had a profound effect on him, and it actually relaxed him greatly. And that passage actually came from the book of Romans. He was reading the book of Romans, and he comes across this passage, and it says, For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, the righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And with this, Martin Luther read this and he felt that God loved him. He had faith and God loved him. And that's, the, and, and that's the grace of God. Luther felt like he was a horrible human being because he constantly had impure thoughts. He felt like he did bad things, even though who knows what those would have been. He certainly lived as clean of a life as possible. But it, it, Luther would just was a man who berated himself. And with this, reading this passage, he feels God's love and it becomes very important to him and very central to his belief, to his personal belief. And so when he translates the Bible, he accentuates this faith alone, that it's not about what you do. God loves you for simply believing in God. Okay, now let's get even more nitty gritty between the differences between the new Lutheran faith and the Roman Catholic faith. So Roman Catholics have something called the seven sacraments. If you are a Catholic uh, and you are a practicing Catholic, you're probably familiar with the seven sacraments because these are seven important moments in your life. I mean, not just seven because one of them can be repeated over and over again, but they are the seven moments in your life where God directly bestows his grace upon you. And so uh, when you're a baby, you're first baptized into the, into the church. And then when you're a little bit older, elementary school age, you're confirmed into the church. Or I'm sorry, that's probably more like middle school age when you, when you go through confirmation. Elementary school age, that's when you do your first Eucharist. You take communion for the first time. And then when you do bad things, small bad or big bad, or <laughs> if, you, if you commit acts of sin, I'm sorry, I'm stumbling over my words here. As you commit sinful acts, you go to a priest to ask for forgiveness. You go to confession, and the priest gives you a penance, something to do to reconcile yourself with God. That is a sacrament. If you become very physically sick, then a priest may anoint you. And then also you choose either to get married and to raise a good Christian family or to marry yourself to the church and become essentially a nun or a priest. And so those are the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church. Now, what's important to know about Martin Luther is the highest law of the land is the Bible, the Word of God. And as he begins the process of creating a new church, a new reformed church, that church must be based on the actual teachings of the Bible, what the Bible says. So anybody at this point in time would have been growing up Catholic and they would be very familiar with the seven sacraments, these would be major aspects of people's individual lives. And Luther puts these seven sacraments under the test of, can they be supported by the Bible? Is there evidence in the Bible that God is bestowing his grace upon you during any of these seven rituals? And of these seven, Luther said that the Bible supports only two, baptism and Eucharist. Eucharist is communion. So in his church, there will be you know, confirmation. Kids will still be confirmed into the Lutheran church. But there's nothing in the Bible that says that God is present or in some way more directly, mystically present at the confirmation. But that confirmation is just a initiation into the church. There's no confessing of sin. There's no anointing the sick. And it, when it comes to being a minister or getting married... Luther says there's nothing in the Bible that says that a minister can't get married. And so for the Lutherans, when they create their church, they have only two of the original seven sacraments. And in the early days of the Reformation, these sacraments were something that were debated, and they influence other Christian religions, other Protestant Christian religions, most of which will have more radical ideas about the seven sacraments that really there's no such thing as a sacrament, that these ceremonies in which God is somehow mystically present, well, that it's just a load of hogwash, that God is everywhere all the time, and that God is no more present during one of these ceremonies than at any other time. 
So those are the seven sacraments and Luther's interpretation of the seven sacraments. I, I hope that made sense. I hope that made sense. If not, I hope you'll ask me some follow-up questions uh, about the seven sacraments. I, I never feel like I do a great job of explaining them. And I certainly apologize for that. Also feel free to, you know, look them up, look at your textbook and see if you get a better, more clear explanation. So, all right, let's return to Martin Luther and his Bible and what it provokes throughout the Holy Roman Empire. Well, let's return to those peasants that were previously buying indulgences, thinking that what they were doing was good and holy and was going to help them and their families. Well, they found out that the Roman Catholic Church was ripping them off. That's what they got out of Martin Luther, Martin Luther's 95 Theses. And the Bible's getting translated into the vernacular and they hear things like, Jesus's serpent, on, <laughs> Jesus's sermon on the mount, in which he said, "Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth." And they hear that Jesus also said things like, "It is easier to squeeze a camel through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God." And the peasants, the lowly peasants, from their understanding of the Bible, there should be no hierarchy. There should be no feudal system with kings and lords and dukes and knights and them on the bottom working the land, that they are all equal in the eyes of God, and that the time has come to deliver heaven on earth, to create the kingdom of God on earth, and to get rid of the feudal system. So hundreds of thousands of German peasants in the Holy Roman Empire rise up, they want to create a great leveling of society where everybody is equal. And so now, all the kings of the Holy Roman Empire, the lords, those electors, their own people are rising up. They want to create a new egalitarian society. They say they were inspired by Martin Luther. This happens, by the way, in the middle of the 1520s, 1525s, when the revolt is kicking up. And there's hundreds of thousands of peasants who are rising up in rebellion against their landlords. How, how are the kings, the princes, the electors, how are they going to respond to this? Well, the peasants' revolt was a revolt against the entire feudal system. The peasants' goal was to create a new, more Christian society where everybody was equal. And they rose up, they killed landlords, they destroyed Catholic churches, and to protect property... The armies of kings and princes, the electors, they were summoned. These would be local militias that were summoned to stop the revolting peasants. Brutal civil wars throughout the Holy Roman Empire went on for approximately one year. In the end, the peasants lost. Somewhere between 70 and 100,000 German peasants died. And as I'm looking at this slide right here, sorry about the extra zero, and the 100,000 there. My apologies for that. Now, where did Martin Luther stand in amid all this? After all, the peasants said it was Luther that inspired him. Well, Luther was mildly supportive of them at first because they wanted to create a new Christian society. But in the end, he doesn't support the peasants' revolt, and that should be obvious because it was Frederick the Wise who was protecting him. If Martin Luther supports the peasant revolt, then he goes against Frederick the Wise. And Luther's not going to do that. It's Frederick the Wise who's been protecting him. But Luther says, you know, the Bible, it's the Bible and the word of God, which is the highest law of the land. And so he cites Jesus during Jesus's own trial when Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Meaning this, as a Christian, you have your life here on earth, the authorities you must obey here, and that you have your spiritual life. So just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you can't, you don't have to listen to your boss or you don't have to pay your taxes, but rather you should know your place in society. You should be obedient. You know, you should do your job, but then in your free time, you should be a good Christian and you should live a Christian life and create a Christian household, and we should have churches that are consistent with the teachings of the Bible. Okay, so 
It should be clear pragmatically why Luther makes this decision. He's being supported by Frederick the Wise. He's being supported by a prince. So therefore, he's not going to advocate a complete social, political, and economic revolution. Yes, he wants to split off from the Roman Catholic Church. But for the most part, Luther still envisions a society with kings and knights and princes and peasants. He wants to maintain that social order. Because Luther stops from supporting this complete social revolution, which a lot of people read in the Bible that, no, we should have a society of equals, that, she, that God looks upon everybody as equals. Because he does that, and he supports the establishment, the feudal hierarchy. This will inspire, after Luther's death, a second wave of reformers who will come along and say, Luther didn't go far enough. And the biggest, most significant of those reformers will be John Calvin. And we'll learn more about him here in a bit. So as the Lutheran church is established, it might be important to know culturally that the Lutheran church... It was the church of the German aristocracy. Even though it was a rebellion against the Roman Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church in itself had its hierarchy. It believed in kings and nobility and that traditional feudal structure of society. But it was still rebelling against the church in Rome. Frederick the Wise knew what he was doing, so let's return to Frederick the Wise and the way he's thinking. Think of it like this. If you're Frederick the Wise... If you're the leader of the Saxon lands, you know that all of that church land in Saxony belongs to the Roman Catholic Church in Rome. The money they collect belongs to the Roman Catholic Church in Rome. Now, if you can support Martin Luther and the people support Martin Luther, you could break free from the church in Rome. You could have your own church, the Lutheran Church, and you sever all ties with Rome. You have your own religious establishment, which means that those lands and the money of the church within your lands now all belong to you. So breaking from Rome empowers you. So this is why Frederick the Wise supported Martin Luther. He had this design in mind. It's what makes Frederick the Wise the Wise. And other German princes jumped on board, in particular, a man by the name of Philip of Hesse. Hesse being a particular region in the Holy Roman Empire. They want to break from Rome. Why do they want to break from Rome? Well, because they don't like the Italians, and they can form their own church, and this empowers them. So an alliance of German princes is formed. This is called the Schmalkaldic League. Yes, that's a mouthful. The Schmalkaldic League. They were all German princes. They all liked Martin Luther, Martin Luther's Bible, Martin Luther's theology. And, and it made it easy for them all to play on the same team. Now, what all of these princes and who are joining the Schmalkaldic League are thinking about, and you know, what's going on in the back of their minds, is Charles V, their emperor. How is Charles V going to respond to these princes within his empire splitting from the Roman Catholic Church? Now, one of the reformers that pops up at this point in time is a man who's more radical than Martin Luther, and his name was Ulrich Zwingli. Zwingli. You may see, mul you may see multiple spellings of his first name, but his last name is always spelled the same way. Zwingli. And Zwingli is from here, Switzerland. Look at beautiful Switzerland, this beautiful mountainous country in the, in, in the middle of Europe. The mountains are so huge in Switzerland. I mean, it's nestled in the middle of the Alps that Switzerland is a very divided region. Switzerland is, of course, not its own country at this point in time. It's part of the larger Holy Roman Empire. Switzerland is itself divided into cantons, which are local provinces. And maybe in part because it's such a divided area, Switzerland has largely been exploited by many other countries in Europe at this point in time, including the papal states, different countries will go to the cantons of Switzerland and give them money for men. So Switzerland produces mercenaries. So you have all these men that are raised in Switzerland that get shipped off to various other armies to serve as mercenaries. And they're all over, including the Swiss guard 
who are essentially the service, the personal protection for the popes. So, and Ulrich Zwingli was one of many Swiss young men who, for a period of time in his life, served as a mercenary. But then came home, was a priest, became a humanist, read the Bible, was like Martin Luther, very upset with the Roman Catholic Church for doing things that could not be supported by the Bible. He considered the Roman Catholic Church a very corrupt institution. And so Zwingli had this idea of uniting all these men in Switzerland who knew how to fight, all these former mercenaries, creating a Swiss army, fighting for their freedom and independence in the same way that they were doing up in Saxony, splitting off for the Roman Catholic Church and creating their own Swiss church. The only thing is, Zwingli was even more radical than Luther. Zwingli did a couple of things which shocked people. The first was something that's just simply fun to talk about called the affair of the sausages. So if you're, if you're Catholic, you may know that you're not supposed to eat meat, at least not cow or pig meat, on Fridays during Lent, which is why stereotypically Catholics eat fish on Friday. And Zwingli said this is not supported by anything in the Bible, so he would in public eat sausages on Fridays during Lent. That might seem silly to you and I today, but back then, raised in the tradition that people were, they are like, oh my gosh, you're going to go to hell. And Zwingli, with confidence, ate sausages in public, saying, no, I'm not going to hell. There's nothing in the Bible to support this. Zwingli also believed in something and advocated something called iconoclasm. And this idea of iconoclasm would really be influential to future Protestant religions. And it's based on Martin Luther's central idea that the, the ultimate source of truth in the world is the Bible. The Bible is your direct line to God. So you read the Bible, you understand the Bible, and you learn directly from God how you are to live your life. Everything else in the world is a distraction. So you, if you go into a Catholic church, like a beautiful cathedral, you're going to see a lot of artwork, a lot of, stained, a lot of stained glass windows, a lot of statues, and all of that stuff is a distraction. So iconoclasm is the destruction of icons. Strip the churches down bare, no artwork, nothing pretty to look at, burn those icons, burn those relics, burn that artwork, destroy, 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 because the only thing you need in your life as a good Christian is the Bible and your brain's ability to read and understand and interpret the Bible for yourself so that you can have direct communication with God. Any statue, any fine work of art, any rosary, all these things are in fact distractions. So Zwingli encouraged his followers to destroy, 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 so that a church should properly look like this. No artwork, no pretty stained glass windows, nothing to distract you from learning the word of God. Zwingli was a radical. When it came to the seven sacraments, Zwingli didn't believe in any of the sacraments. So Zwingli's an interesting guy down in Switzerland, uniting all these former Swiss mercenaries into a Swiss army. They're going to break free from the Holy Roman Empire, at least that's their goal. They're going to have their own church. Their own church is going to be more radical than the Lutheran church. And so this is a problem. Luther is the first Protestant. He's the first theologian to say, oh, the way the Roman Catholic Church is doing it is wrong, and I've read the Bible, and here's how we should do it based upon the Bible, and this is my church, the Lutheran Church, and it's based upon the Bible and my interpretation of the Bible. Zwingli comes along and says, I'm creating a church that's based upon the Bible. It's different from yours. Our churches are going to look different. We don't believe in any sacraments. Zwingli does believe in a more egalitarian society, a less feudal society. And Zwingli says, my church is based upon the Bible. So now we have multiple interpretations of the Bible and what a church should be. So this division really early on in the 1520s, this isn't good. Because at this point in time, Charles V, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, wants none of this. He wants everybody to be Catholic, everybody to be Catholic. So he doesn't like Luther, and he doesn't like Zwingli. He does not like the Schmacaldic League. So Charles V is getting an imperial army of Spaniards and, uh, and of Italians to drive into these lands to destroy 
the armies of Zwingli and the Schmacaldic League and kill all the Lutherans and reestablish the Roman Catholic Church everywhere in the Holy Roman Empire. And that military force is coming. So Philip of Hesse, the guy who created the Schmacaldic League, who was uniting all of the German princes, creating a military alliance as they separated from Rome, he says, okay, Zwingli, Luther, we need to have a talk. We need to actually meet. And so they met in the German town of Marburg, and Luther was there, Zwingli was there, and Philip of Hesse was there. And what they tried to do is come to a consensus on what the church should be like, what society should be like based upon the actual teachings of the Bible. And Zwingli said, there are no sacraments and we should have an egalitarian society, get rid of feudalism. And Luther and Philip of Hesse both are like, this guy is crazy. He wants complete social revolution. He wants the same things that the peasants that were revolting in 1525 wanted a complete social, political, and economic revolution. And Luther does not want that huge social upheaval. So the Marburg Colloquy was a failure in terms of uniting Zwingli and the Swiss with the rest of the Lutheran princes like Philip of Hesse and Frederick the Wise. And because of that, Zwingli is left on his own. Zwingli and the Swiss will not be part of the Schmacaldic League. They're on their own to defend Switzerland to create their new church. That Marburg Colloquy happened in the year 1529, the following year of 1530. Charles V held a Diet in Augsburg. At this Diet, four of the electors of the Holy Roman Empire kneeled before Charles V, professed their belief in the new Lutheran faith, and announced their willingness to die for that new faith. They also presented Charles V with a document, the Augsburg Confession, explaining their reasons for why they were breaking from the Roman Catholic Church. This was an important moment in the history of the Reformation because now you have officially lands within the Holy Roman Empire officially proclaiming they are separating from the Catholic Church. Now Charles V does not want this. He wants his empire to be unified under one faith, the Roman Catholic faith, his faith. So Charles V's imperial army first goes into Switzerland and in the year 1531 defeats Zwingli's army and kills Ulrich Zwingli. And still today, throughout most of Switzerland, the dominant religion is Catholicism. Charles V is prepared to lead his imperial army up north to face off against the Schmalkaldic Leagues, and those Schmalkaldic Wars are coming in approximately 10 years. But before that, poor Charles V, poor Charles V, he had a lot of problems. He faced attacks on all sides. Throughout so much of our study of European history, we find that the Habsburgs are consistently enemies with whatever family is ruling France. While all this is going on during the time of Martin Luther in the early 16th century, France, those Lutheran ideas will creep into France, but not yet. This was the king of France. He was a man by the name of Francis I. He was from the Valois dynasty in France. Now, you can understand Francis I's perspective if you just simply look at a map of Europe. You know, find France. Now to the south of France, you have Spain. Who rules Spain? Charles V. To the east of France, you have the Holy Roman Empire. Who rules all these lands? Charles V. North of France, you have England. Well, who's on the throne up in England? Well, a guy by the name of Henry VIII, whose wife is the aunt of Charles V. France is completely surrounded. And Francis I finds this very intimidating. And as always, there are contested lands. You remember Navarre, that region that straddles the Pyrenees Mountains that separates Spain and France? Well, those are one of the regions that Francis I feels like, I, I, I need to take that region and make it part of France, an uncontested part of France. And so he does. He knows that Charles V is busy with you know, all these problems going on with the Reformation and the Holy Roman Empire. So the French army goes into Spain and begins the process of claiming the entirety of Navarre. 
So Charles V, very angry and upset with Francis I and would love to go to war with him, but he's got to deal with all the problems with the Reformation. And as you'll soon find out, he's got other people attacking him too. But there's one thing potentially he has going for them. A king just can't attack a land and claim the land as his own at this point in time in history. He must get the blessing of the Pope. It's the Pope that decides who has the legitimate right to rule over particular land. So the Pope at the time, and the time being specifically the year 1527, the Pope at the time was Pope Clement VII. Pope Clement VII was the son of Lorenzo de Medici, Lorenzo the Magnificent, Lorenzo I, the big one. His niece is the Queen of France, or is rather the future Queen of France, and he grants Navarre to the French. The Pope says, Navarre, that's yours, France. Congratulations, you took it, it's yours. And Charles V is like, what? Here I am trying to defend the Catholic faith throughout the Holy Roman Empire, and the Pope takes a chunk of Spain and gives it to France. So Charles V, how does he respond to this? Well, he takes the imperial army, he and he goes to Rome. When he gets to Rome, the imperial army, which has been unpaid and unfed, they get to Rome and they sack Rome. They kill about 5,000 people in Rome. They take their food, they take their stuff, they take their money. Rome gets sacked by the imperial army of Charles V. And Pope Clement VII gets captured and placed on house arrest. So Pope Clement VII, the Pope, has to do exactly what Charles V tells him to do, including giving Navarre back to Spain. All right, up in France, always just have to reiterate this from time to time when I'm talking about this era. You've got King Francis I of the Valois dynasty. You have his son, Henry II of France, who married into the Medici line, which is why Clement VII was interested in allowing the French to take Navarre. He had this personal familial connection. Uh, Just to let you know, in the future, Henry II isn't going to live too long. He's going to die in a jousting accident. And uh, this Catherine de' Medici will become a very powerful and significant ruler in French history. But that's for a later lecture. All right, back to Francis I. Let's look at the map again. We see France. France feels surrounded by, uh, by Charles V's empire. And Francis I wants to take land away from Charles V. And one of the things that Francis I does, which arguably is helpful for him, is that he makes an alliance with a very powerful empire on the other side of the Holy Roman Empire. So can Francis and the French, can they find a friend on the other side of the Holy Roman Empire so that essentially the whole Holy Roman Empire will feel squished in between two enemies? Now, one of the things that the French are going to start doing is marrying into, or that's not exactly true. Um, I shouldn't say marrying into, creating alliances with Poland. So you see Poland on the other side there. Poland and the French will have a long-lasting alliance Also, let me just start saying right now, Poland never has a Reformation. They remain proudly Roman Catholic, and that plays, Roman Catholicism plays a very important role throughout Polish history. It even becomes very important in the 1980s. And Francis, but Francis I looks also to the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans that sacked Constantinople and took that in the year 1453 have continued to press westward which means encroaching in on the Holy Roman Empire and especially the Habsburg homeland of Austria. So the French create an alliance with the Ottomans. Here's a pretty cool image of uh, the French king, Francis I, and the Ottoman Sultan. The Sultan is the emperor of the Holy, or or of the Ottoman Empire. And of course, with this particular image, you've got to be impressed with that turban. And the Ottomans in 1529 get really close to Vienna. And so Charles V's imperial troops, after sacking Rome in 1527, two years later find themselves at the gates of Vienna, defending Vienna from the Ottomans. While they're doing this, this gives the French time to try to take lands away from, the, from, from Charles V. It also gives the Lutherans op- an opportunity to establish themselves and prepare their militaries and not have to fight. But then when the 1540s roll around, 10 years later, the Schmalkaldic League is up within the empire fighting the armies of the princes who are Lutheran. 
1547, there is the Lutheran Schmalkaldic victory at the Battle of Drakenberg. And after that, the Imperial army just cannot gain ground against the unified Lutheran princes. And so Charles V, at age 55, in the year 1555, decides to give up. He summons the electors of the Holy Roman Empire once again to the city of Augsburg down in Bavaria. And Charles V issues to them his peace treaty. This is the Peace of Augsburg in 1555. This is one of the most important documents in all of European history. This document is considered to be a foundational document in the history of religious tolerance. What the Peace of Augsburg says is this. Within the Holy Roman Empire, the princes of the empire may choose the religion of their lands. They, however, have the choice between one of only two religions. Those two possible religions are Catholicism and Lutheranism. You are not allowed to be a radical like a Zwingli. And at this point in time, in 1555, there's other radical religions that are growing, like Calvinism. We'll learn more about those later. And that's it. That's the Peace of Augsburg. So let me repeat what the Peace of Augsburg is, and then let me talk about the significance and implications of the Peace of Augsburg. So the Peace of Augsburg, as issued by Charles V, states in so many words that the princes of their individual regions throughout the Holy Roman Empire have the opportunity to choose the religion for their realm. In fact, there's a particular phrase that goes along with this. The phrase is, whose realm, whose religion. So in other words, whoever rules the land gets to choose the religion for the land. And of course, they get the choice between Catholicism and Lutheranism. But they are still all part of the Holy Roman Empire, but now the Holy Roman Empire is an empire that is divided religiously, but not politically. The political structure is still the same. Okay, so what's the significance of the Peace of Augsburg? All right, well, first of all, the Pope immediately condemns the Peace of Augsburg. No surprise there. The Roman Catholic Church is now officially losing influence and power. Okay, and hopefully you can see how this is a, an important document in the history of religious tolerance. You've got one country, and for the first, or one empire rather, and for the first time you have permission to a certain degree within this empire to have multiple faiths. This is not completely unheard of within the history of Europe, but certainly very rare. But one of the important things to think about at this point in time is how well, if this is a peace treaty, how well will this keep the peace? So a good way to think of this is to think of the structure, the political structure of the Peace of Augsburg. It's the prince of a realm who chooses the religion. So let's say the prince, he wants to be Lutheran, but the majority of the people are Catholic or vice versa. If you have a Lutheran, as a prince, but the majority of the people want to be another religion, especially as some of those radical religions that we're going to learn about, as soon as they start to become popular, like Calvinism will become incredibly popular. What happens when you have a Lutheran prince and the majority of the people start to become Calvinist? What then? That is an important thing to think about. The other thing to think about is how this divides culturally the Holy Roman Empire, how it starts to split up Central Europe. So if in the future, when Catholics and Protestants again go to war with each other, how this war is going to create a civil war within the Holy Roman Empire. And that is, and both of those things you need to think about, both the political structure, what if the prince is of a different religion than his people, and this cultural split in the Holy Roman Empire, both of those things will be significant in an event that we call the Thirty Years War that begins some 70-ish years after the Peace of Augsburg. So Charles V, you should be able to figure out, was 55 years old in the year 1555. He retired the following year 
I find this fascinating because there are very few kings or emperors or empresses or queens that we that I can talk about that retire. In fact, Charles V is really the only one. The rest of them serve as rulers till their death. And if they're too tired to rule or if they're too mentally unstable to rule, there's a regent that rules for them, but they don't retire. But Charles V retired. He simply said, I'm, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to rule anymore. And so he retired in the year 1556, and he retired to a monastery in Eusta, which was outside of Madrid in central Spain, where he was entertained by musicians and artists and just relaxed. He just relaxed for the rest of his days, and those days were short. Charles V died in the year 1558. Now, when he died, he had a couple of children, one of which was illegitimate. Charles V had a girlfriend, a mistress, in his ancestral homeland of Austria, and with her he had a son by the name of Don John, and Don John will go on to become an important naval com commander. But he also had a legitimate son with his wife, and his name was Philip II of Spain. And that is his title. He is not Philip II Holy Roman Emperor, because Charles V felt that ruling both the lands of the Holy Roman Empire and the lands of Spain, it was simply too much that the empire, his empire, needed to be divided. So Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, gave to his son the lands of Spain. That would include Spain and the southern part of the Italian peninsula, including Sicily and Sardinia, and all of the Spanish conquest in the Americas. He also gave to his son, Philip II, the Netherlands. The Netherlands were the homeland of Charles V's grandma, Mary of Burgundy. Also, if you remember, Charles V's wife was uh, Portuguese, and so Philip II also got Portugal. And this was one of the brief periods of time in which Portugal and Spain were united. Philip II will inherit all this. Philip II will also be a passionate, devout Catholic who really endeavors to get back what his dad lost. He hates this new heretical Lutheran religion and the new Protestant religions that are springing up out of that. And so Philip II plays a very important role in our next unit on the religious wars. Charles V then gave the Holy Roman Empire his possessions in Central Europe to his younger brother, Ferdinand I. Ferdinand I was living in the ancestral Habsburg homelands of Austria, and from Vienna, Ferdinand I would rule the Holy Roman Empire and would have to honor the Peace of Augsburg of 1555. So as we move forward in European history, just know that the Habsburgs, there's sort of two branches of Habsburgs. We have the Habsburg emperors who rule the Holy Roman Empire, and then we have the Spanish Habsburgs who rule Spain and all of Spain's possessions, the Spanish Empire. If we return to the family tree of Charles V, once again, we can see where Philip II lines up on this and how he unites Spain and Portugal. So with the Peace of Augsburg of 1555 and the retirement of Charles V and the splitting up of his lands into the Holy Roman Empire and the Spanish Empire, I think this is a great place to pause and to end this first part of the story of the Reformation. And good job, guys. There's a lot going on with all of this. I'm sure a lot of you are feeling the complexity of European history. I hope you're taking good notes. I hope when you don't understand something, you're able to take the time to ask me follow-up questions. Let me know what I can explain better so that you can better understand this magnificent story of European history. And the Reformation, boy, it's complicated, but you cannot underestimate its importance. The Renaissance and the Reformation, these are the things that created modern Europe. I hope for the most part you're enjoying it, and I hope you're learning lots. All right, talk to you next time, and have a wonderful day.